born again. I heard a story about this little boy called Karen McCauley. He was born and raised in Glasgow, Scotland. And at the age of two, he kept on telling his mom that he was not from Glasgow. He was actually from Barra. Barra is a little island off the uh, west coast of Scotland. And she just dismissed it. But time went on, he was very adamant, very persistent that he was not from Glasgow. And he even gave intimate details about the place where he lived. He said he lived in a, a, a one-story white house and he had seven brothers and sisters. His father's name was Shane Robertson and they even had a black and white dog. Eventually, as time passed, the parents decided to just go and find out what's going on. So they took him to Barra in an old plane that's not far from Glasgow. So they flew over in a small plane. They initially got there and they started to investigate and they found nothing. No one knew anything about the Robertsons. There was no White House they could find. So they went to the National Archives office on the island. And they said, no, there is a, a, a one-story White House, but it's on the other side of the island. So there they went. And as they took him towards the house, little Cameron was very, very quiet. The mom said, is this the house that you're talking about? He said, yes. No one on the island knew who Shane Robertson was. But that house belonged to the Robertsons. They went in and they found a family portrait. Eight children and a dog. What color was the dog? Black and white. How did young Cameron have intimate details about this place? He couldn't have. He was like a two-year-old child. He, he, he couldn't have known and he hasn't been there. No one's told him about this place. It's not even the people on the island knew details about it. Interesting, isn't it? They call him the boy who lived before. Or better yet, the boy who was born again. Now in the Bible it speaks about being born again too. Jesus tells us what the true meaning of being born again is all about. So if you want to find out, let's turn to John chapter 3 in the Bible. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 3. And we're going to read about what Jesus talks about when he says you have to be born again. Thank you, Tony. John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a number of Jewish living council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing in God and not with you. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter the second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Thank you. Nicodemus, a well-known man, in Bible times, <coughs> tradition tells us that he was the third richest person in Jerusalem. Third richest person in Jerusalem. A lot of money on him. He was a ruler in Israel, which means he was well respected, well admired by the people. When he walked in the speech, people used to uh, acknowledge him and nod their head, they used to show their kids, I think he was Nicodemus. A very well known man. He was also a Pharisee, which means he was a religious elite of Jerusalem and Israel. These guys meant meticulously adhere to the law of Moses, they done nothing wrong. If there was anybody any more spiritually good and moral, it would be Nicodemus. So one night this man Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, you know, a couple of us have been thinking and we've realized that you must come from heaven because of the miraculous signs you are doing. And he said this in a statement and also like a question. He was going to question Jesus also. It was kind of like, Jesus, I know you come from heaven because you do these miraculous signs, right? And it was like that. And then Jesus replies to him, and Jesus says to him, uh, completely unrelated to what you were saying, Jesus says to him, the only way you can enter the kingdom of heaven is by being born again. It's got nothing to do with what Nicodemus was asking. Nicodemus is confused because he's talking about being born again. He says, but how can it be? How can an old person be born again? You can't get into your mother's womb a second time. He had no idea that Jesus was talking about spiritual things. And often that was a problem with Jesus when he came in the Gospels. He spoke about spiritual things and the people could not relate. And even in Nicodemus he says, you don't even understand physical things as going on. How can I then relate to spiritual things? And again he says to Nicodemus, 
Listen, buddy, I'm telling you, you will not enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Everyone say that. Born again. Yes. And the reason he was so adamant and persistent about this, even ignoring what Nicodemus was saying, is because he knew where Nicodemus was coming from. He knew Nicodemus had a lot of money. In those days, people thought if you had lots of money, you were blessed by God. And you were the first who's going to get to heaven. Prosperity. And then, because he was well in mind and well liked, he had all the fame, they could have got him to heaven. And obviously he was spiritually elite. He had yet all the laws of Moses. There was one person that could have got him to heaven. It should have been Nicodemus. And Jesus knew that that is not how he came into heaven. He was saying to Nicodemus, without even saying anything, he was saying, Nicodemus, you've got all the money in the world. That's not going to save you. Yeah, sure, you're respected and admired by a lot of people. That's not going to get you into heaven. Nicodemus, you're so good, you're morally good, you're probably the, the, the most good person in all of Israel. You know what? That's not going to get you into heaven. The only way that's going to get you into heaven, Nicodemus, is by being born again. You're saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, it's not about what you have. It's not about who you are. It's not about how good you are. The only thing that's going to get you into heaven is if you are born again. And what did Jesus mean by being born again? You see, the Bible is very clear that when you and I are born into this world, we are born into sin. We are born dead in sin. We have inherited the old um, sinful nature of our ancestor Adam. So when we were born, we were really condemned on the way to hell. And when we become Christians, we become born again of the Spirit. What happens then is you inherit the spiritual righteous nature of who? Of Jesus. You see that? So you discard of the nature of Adam and when you're born again and become a Christian, you inherit the nature of Jesus. You see what it says in Corinthians. It says to Corinthians 5, Therefore if any man be, say in Christ. In Christ. I didn't hear that. Say it one more time. In Christ. He is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is what he's saying. If you want to be born again, you've got to discard of your old nature that Adam gave you and you've got to inherit the nature of Christ. Notice those words, in Christ. It says this in Romans. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. When you were born, you were born dead to sin. No hope for you. You were on your way to hell. As soon as you were born, as soon as you went, like my sons used to do when they were there, and your eyes opened, you were on your way to hell. You were dead in sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. There's those words again, in Christ. You see that? The most two most important words in the Bible, those words, you know that? In Christ. The Apostle Paul uses that 97 times. 97 times in 30 books, he uses those words, in Christ. But I know we all used to uh, Jesus being in us. Isn't that what we normally sing about? And we tell our kids, Jesus is in you, and Jesus is in me, and he lives in me. We're so used to the idea that Jesus is in us. Have you ever thought about the fact that you are also in Jesus? How can that be? How can you be in Jesus and Jesus in you? Well, for that I'm going to show you an illustration. If you like practical illustrations, I'm not going to get on the chair, don't worry. All right. I've got myself the biggest table I could possibly find. And I've got a bowl of water. Free baptisms today. A bowl of water. It's not going to be a magic trick, so don't worry. I'm going to make this thing disappear. If I could, I wouldn't be here. Or I would be in Hollywood or somewhere. There we go. So we are talking about being in Christ. And this is full of a bit more with more holy water from the taps of you, paint. <laughs> okay, so there we have a bowl of water, and in my hand on this side we have an empty bottle. Empty bottle. Yes, you all have a magic trick. No magic tricks here. <laughs> An empty bottle, a bowl of water. So what happens now is I'm going to put this empty bottle into the water. This represents you and I before we become Christians. Okay? Non-believer. The water represents the living water, which is Jesus. Okay, so I'm going to put this bottle into here. So the, the dry bottle I'm going to put it into the water. Are you with me? Okay, yeah. yeah, so it goes in. So now, can, can you see that the bottle is in the, in the bowl? Yeah, it's in the water. So the bowl is, the, the bottle is in the water, right? Okay, now when I take it out, see what also happens. It's not also the water in the bottle. You see that? It's magic. It is magic after all, isn't it? 
Here we go. So there's two things happening here. Not only is the bottle going into the water, but the water is also going into the bottle. You see how easy it is? Are you in Jesus? Yes. Is Jesus is in you? Yes. Jesus is in you as much as you are in him. I want to show you something else about this very, very powerful, I think, but practical illustration is Jesus is in, in you. All right? So that's it. You're going to heaven. Because why? Because the water is in you. Jesus is in you. That's saved, sealed, you're on your way to heaven. But notice you have a bit of capacity here. Do you see that? It's not fully. And many Christians live their life with Jesus in them and thinking, well, that's it. That's all I've got. Jesus is in me. I'm on the way to heaven. I'm not going to do anything else. And man, they miss out on the power, the presence, the blessing, the favor. Because they are not filling themselves up with Jesus. Notice what happens when you go into Jesus more, the more he comes into you. And remember how little bit it was? And now notice, wow, so much. So I ask you today, which Christian are you? Do you have so much of Jesus? Or do you have so much of Jesus? Or are you actually filling yourself so much with Jesus? That you are you, you praying regularly, you read your Bible, gain your Bible study, hanging out with vision. You get so full with Jesus, you know what happens? You get so full that eventually you start overflowing. And look what happens. Jesus comes out of you. Do you see that? And that's how we should be living our lives. We should be living our lives overflowing with Jesus. When people see, they mustn't see you, they must see Jesus in you. And when you just walk by, people know that there's something different with you. They want what you want. You don't even have to preach on the sidewalks. Because people will know that you've got so much of Jesus in you. It will overflow and bless him. Do you get that illustration? Jesus is in you. And you are also in him. So Jesus in this new birth, in this being born again, gives you his nature. All of us sitting here today, are we perfect? Some of you are. Let me see. Let me see the perfect one. No, no way. It's a check in. But are you perfect in Christ? Yes, because He is perfect. So when God gives you His nature, when Jesus gives you His nature, He is perfect. And when God looks at you, He doesn't see you in your weakness, in your failure, in your sin. He sees you in Jesus. And if Jesus is perfect, then you are perfect. That is what the new birth is all about. It's not about how many sins you got. How, what your past life is, how many sins are you going to commit today or tomorrow? It's about who is you are, and you are a child of God, and Jesus is in you. And not only does He give you a new nature, but He also gives you a new name. And it's a very cryptic, beautiful verse in the Bible in Revelations. It says, I will give Him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows, saving He that receiveth it. In this verse Jesus talks about giving us a white stone with a new name on it. Many commentators have different views about what this stone is. The one theory I did like was in the biblical times what they used to do was when you become close friends with somebody, you, you get a close relationship with somebody, what they would do was they would take a white stone, break it in half, and you would write your name on one side and you would write your name on the other one, and then you would exchange those things. So Brent stone now becomes mine and his, and I give mine to his. And then everyone who sees that stone, and they see, uh, I've got Brent on mine, they know that me and Brent are very, very close friends. We are very good friends. Everything that belongs to you belongs to me. If you go to the town of the spring and people see you with that stone, you know what? The family just opens up the house to you. Because they know that you're so good friends with their son, they're going to just give you everything that is his. Isn't that beautiful? That's what Jesus does to you. He comes and He makes a relationship with you. It's not about the ritual. It's not about the rules and the doctrines of the church. It's about the relationship with Jesus Christ Himself. The question that you've got to ask yourself before leaving this church is, are you a friend of Christ Jesus? Who can say that honestly and personally? And do you know what a friend is? Someone you talk to a lot. Someone you rely on. Someone you listen to a lot. Are we that kind of friend with Jesus? Have we given our name to him and has he given his name to you for another you want another practical example yes i know you want i'm going to actually give you those stones today right from heaven so i'm going to let tony hand out these stones thank you tony quick quick so what you're going to be getting is two stones you're going to get a stone with the name of jesus and you're going to get another stone with nothing on it. And what what names on me? Ray. Ray. Who's Ray? That's me. Yeah. 
And that stone is giving you these stones. You're going to be getting one with Jesus, and you're going to give me one blank stone. So what I want each of you to do today is to take that blank stone. When you get home, you're going to write your name on it. Are you going to do that? Yes. You're going to write your name on it. You know what I want you to do with that stone? I want you to bury it. Bury it in the garden, in the pot plant, wherever you want. Just bury it. Only you and God knows where it is. Nobody else knows. And the name of Jesus, I want you to keep something very prominent. You can put it in your pocket, your handbag, office desk, uh, at work. Put it on your mantel piece at home. But I want you to put it somewhere where you will see it every day. And every time you see that, what are you going to think about? This is your my friend. Is. You know, when people see that stone, they're going to say, what is that? And you're going to tell them very honestly, very openly, transparently, this is my friend. Because Jesus gave me his name. Everything that's his is mine. And where's your stone? In the dirt. Who cares? No one cares about you, alright? This is not about you. It's about the name that's on the stone. It's not about you, Greg. It's not about me. It's not about Brent. It's about Jesus. In 10 years time, 20 years time, this might mean nothing. No one's ever going to find it. It's going to be in the dirt in the backyard. But this name. Oh, this name. This name lives forever. And when people see this, they're going to know, Ah, oh, Ilan, is that your friend? Are you going to say, yes, Jesus is my friend? Not only did you receive a new nature from Christ, but you got his own name. And you know when you get to heaven one day, what are you going to be show this at the door? Do you know that? You don't have to have money, you know, it's not going to be like a toll gate, like the e-tolls in Job, but no. You just go and, as you pull out this, you know what God's going to say? He's going to say, wow, Raymond, I see you've got the name of my son. That means you and Jesus are close friends. <coughs> Man, come inside, come into heaven. Everything you see is yours. Because you've got the name of Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? You have a friend in high places, can I tell you so much. When you hold this, when you see it, you're going to think of one thing. Jesus is my friend. And you're going to hold this tight. Don't hold it too tight now because the name might come off. And I'm not doing it again. It took me a long time to paint this thing and write this up there. But every time you hold this stone, you'll know what it means. Jesus Christ gave you His name. And everything that is His is yours. Because you are now a friend of Almighty God. Not only did He give you a new nature, but He gave you a new name. Thank you, Tony. You can take one too. If you. Uh, I'm selling these for 20 bucks. One is this. Jesus goes on with Nicodemus and he wants to ask him, uh, he wants to explain more because this is just a fly that he's in. Nicodemus has no idea what's going on in the born again story. So he goes and explains to him again. He says, Nicodemus, remember in the Old Testament there was a story about Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness. And they were walking around and the Israelites were complaining and grumbling and God sent poisonous snakes out into the camp. Remember that story? And the snakes bit the people. So Moses intervened and he said, God, please help us with this. So God said, okay, it's fine. All I want you to do is to make a, a brass or a bronze snake. Put it on the pole. Raise up the pole. And everyone in the camp, as soon as they see it, they'll be healed. That's all that happened. So Moses done that. He lifted up the snake. Everyone who saw it was immediately healed. What a miracle. All they had to do was look at the snake. So Jesus uses that as an analogy. He says, so as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And as he's lifted up, everyone who sees him and believes on him will have everlasting life. You see, Jesus is nailing that point that the only way you're going to get to heaven is by who? By Jesus, by him. It's not about who you are, how much money you got, or the doctrines of the church, or about what denomination you are. It's about one person that's a person that died for you on the cross, and his name is Jesus. And he was nailing this point. And you know, sometimes we make it so complicated as Christians. You know, I still believe the biggest time we've got for non-believers to become Christians is you and me, the Christians, the church. Because before someone steps into the church, before they even cross over, we've given them the rule book of the church. We've given them all the rituals and the rules that they've got to adhere to. We tell them that when they're born, they've got to be christened. We tell them when they're 16, they've got to be confirmed. We tell them that when they're adults, they've got to be baptized. And you've got to dress like this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to give your tenth to the church. And we, we give them all of that, and where's Jesus? Nowhere. The first thing when someone comes into the church, we should all be pointing to the cross. Because that's what it's all about. It's not about the rituals and the rules and the doctrines and dogmas of the church. Who cares what denomination you are? It's not going to get you into heaven. 
We complicate matters. We push people out of the church because we want to impose our rules, our rituals upon them. We should be just pointing to one thing. Jesus said, as the Son of Man, you left up. It was easy. Whoever sees and believes will have everlasting life. Who knows Shoah Gomez? One person. Okay, who really knows Shoah Gomez? Okay, one or two of you. Shoah Gomez and Dr. Watson were at camping one night. So they had a nice meal, they had some wine, they retired to their tent, one tent. Nothing funny happening there in those days. Maybe, I don't know. So Sherlock and Dr. Watson, they retired to their tent. About three o'clock in the morning, Sherlock looks up and he looks at the sky and sees the stars and he nudges Dr. Watson. And he says, Watson, look up. What do you see? Watson looks up and sees, and he says, I see millions of stars. He says, what does that tell you? Dr. Watson says, well, Astronomically, that tells me that there are millions of stars out in the universe. Theologically, that tells me that there's a great God in the universe who designed all this. Meteorologically, it tells me that tomorrow is going to be a beautiful day. So he looks at Sherlock and says, Sherlock, what does it mean to you? Sherlock looks at him and says, it means somebody stole our tent. It was simple, really. And the tent was mine. It wasn't about the stars and my God and theology. And that's not real. We, we, we try to open the complicated man. Sometimes we just got to tell someone that it's about Jesus. Forget about everything else. It's not about how many souls there are. It's not about whether tomorrow's going to be good or bad day. It's about Jesus. The tent was missing. Do you get that? It's a good one, isn't it? Sure, I'll go on with that. Love sure, I'll go on. The tent was missing. We have a complicated manners. All we got to do is point people to the cross. And that'll be it. So at the end of Jesus says that, this is now, you'll, you'll get this in a second, this is John chapter 3, verse 15. Okay, where Jesus talks about the Son of Man who lifted up and, and the snake. And I think we know what's coming next. Jesus says ends on the most beautiful verse in all the Bible. I think you know what it is. What is it? John 3, verse 16. Just after that, just after that. Jesus said, okay, I can't get better than this. I'm going to give it to you straight. He said, for God so loved the world. The world, that's you and me. The rich and the poor. I point myself as being poor. For God so loved the world. The good looking and the better looking. <laughs> for God so loved the world. The clever and the not so clever. For God so loved the world. That's the Jew, the Greek, the male, the female, the rich or poor. The black, the white, the clever, the not so clever. God loved everyone so much that He gave us His only Son, Jesus, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. <coughs> Jesus could not have made it more simple than that. And I wish that Christians and the church could just go back to this verse and understand how easy it is to be saved, how easy it is to get into heaven. It's only through <coughs> Jesus Christ Himself. This verse. It's one of the most prominent verses. It's, been, it's the most translated verse in all of the world in history. I think it's been translated 1,200 times already. In, during the Reformation times, in the early 1500s, there was only one church at that time. Anybody know what that church was? The Roman Catholic Church. There was only one church and only one Bible translation. Do you know that? Only one Bible translation. It was the Latin Vulgate. It was a Bible in Latin. There's no language of the Roman Empire at the time. So what happened was... A young man uh, grew up as a priest and a monk in the Catholic Church, and his name was Martin Luther. And Martin Luther opposed the ways of the Catholic Church, and he said, listen, I've read the Latin, I've studied it, and this is wrong, what you guys are teaching, and it, that there's nothing about Jesus. It's the only way you're going to get to heaven is through faith, by grace, and believing in Jesus. And the Catholic Church hated him for it. And they persecuted him. They actually wanted to kill him. So Martin Luther eventually had to go and escape, and he lived at a friend of his house, a castle, a prince of one of the lands. And he lived there for a year, and while he was there, he started to translate the Latin Bible into German, the language of the people of his, of his country, Germany. So while he was doing that, at this time, there was a crazy contraption just being invented called the printing press. Do you remember Gutenberg's printing press? Yeah? So what this used to do, instead of writing everything out, this thing used to just go and block off a page of the Bible at time. Very, very good thing to do. So they can make lots of copies of the Bible. Anyway, the one printer that Luther used, his daughter was busy cleaning up the printing office, the printing store. 
And while she was cleaning up, she found a piece of paper on the floor. And she picked it up. And, and all, the, uh, all that was on the paper was this. It was an unfinished piece of work. And, and that's all it said. And, and she looked at it. And what does it say? Again? And you see, it's not finished. It's from where? What verse? John 3, 16. But it wasn't finished. She didn't know that. She didn't know the Bible. All she read was this. For God so loved the world he gave. And you know what? She got so excited. She got so happy and excited. She, she thought to herself, the fact that God would give me anything is, wow, that's enough. And she got so happy and excited, she went home. And her mother could see that she was excited and happy. And her mother said, well, what's wrong? She took out the paper and said, look. The mother looked and she said, for God so loved the world he gave. The mother said, gave what? The little girl said, I don't know. But the fact that God loved me so much, so much and gave me anything is enough for me not to be afraid of it. Isn't that beautiful? This little girl understood the gospel from this one half-finished verse. And you know what the good news is? God didn't just give us anything. He gave us everything. There is nothing else you can add to Jesus. Once you get Jesus, you have everything. Once you get to heaven, there is no other heaven. That is it. So Jesus loves you so much that He gave you everything. His Son. I'd actually like you to get a copy of this and keep it on you. Give it to people as a social experiment. You see, what do they get out of it? If a little girl back in the 1500s, you'd see that there's a God out there that loves us so much that could give us something. Wow. If it impacted her life so much, how much more would it impact us? Who understand this verse? Not only do you understand this verse, but you understand the whole chapter now. Because I explained to you where that beautiful verse comes from. There's another verse. One more verse before we go. The last verse. Jesus continues. John 3, 17. After he says, for God so loved the world, he says this. For God will not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. People have this idea that God condemns us to hell. Have you ever heard of that? If you talk to non-believers, they have the idea that when God is just an evil, wicked God, and He's just sending people to hell if they don't obey the Ten Commandments. But that's not who God is. You see, when you're born, you're really condemned. God's got nothing to do with that. When you're born, you're on your way to hell. But God, in His loving words, He saw it fit that He needed to save you. So every one of us, when we were born, we were destined for hell. God said, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to help you guys out. And what am I going to do? I'm going to give you my son. And he'll die. And when he dies for you, you just look at him and you just believe what he done. Have faith in the shed work and blood of Christ. You'll be saved. That, I believe, is a more important one than the one before. Because this is where the church gets it wrong. This is where people get it wrong. God is not out there to condemn you. He loves you so much that he didn't just give you anything. He gave you everything. And everything has a name. And hold up your stones. The one with the name on it. And he gave you everything. And together we're going to say what the name is. And his name is? Jesus. One more time. His name is? Jesus. Amen. Now we're going to sing a beautiful song.